Hello everyone, welcome to our lab tour here at Oak Ridge National Lab. I'm Xuan Hao Lu, a research scientist in the Quantum Communication and Networking Group as part of the Quantum Information Science sections. Joining me today is our postdoc, Alex Milshevsky. Together, we're excited to show you around one of our quantum labs on campus. The lab we'll be touring today is where we are building tools to generate and manipulate entangled photon sources. We'll be exploring two types of these sources and delve into how we integrate them into our quantum local area network. Let's get started. On these two optical tables, we conduct multiple quantum experiments and projects. A common goal across these projects is to develop quantum photonic systems that are highly compatible with existing fiber optic networks, maximizing the use of telecommunication infrastructures. Most of the photon sources we develop here operate at wavelength in the conventional band and the long wavelength band, or C band and L band in short. Due to their low loss transmission optical fibers, these two optical bands, ranging from 1530 to 1620 nanometers, are ideal for optical communication in our everyday classical networks. By using these wavelengths, we can also transmit single photons and entangled photons in optical fibers for long distance quantum communications. Single mole fibers can support a very large optical bandwidth. When designing and building these entangled photon sources, we aim for broadband operations meaning that our single photon sources can make full use of the entire C-band and L-band. To generate entangled photons, we commonly use a process called spontaneous parametric down conversions. High-energy pump photons around 780 nanometers are guided into these commercially available periodically poled lithium ionized waveguides or piplin waveguides. Small portion of these pump photons will spontaneously decay into pairs of daughter photons that share a strong time-energy correlations. These daughter photons are roughly half of the pump frequency, or double the pump wavelength, around 1560 nanometers. Their frequency distribution is de determined by the Piplin waveguide design, known as the phase matching bandwidth. We refer to the lower frequency photon as either photons and the higher frequency one as signal photons. Ideally, if we detect the frequency or arrival time of one photon, we can infer the properties of its partner photons. In addition to the inherent time energy entanglements, we can use this Piplin waveguide in more complex optical designs to introduce other types of entanglements. Today, we will discuss polarization entanglements, a very classic example in every quantum mechanics textbook. One technique to create polarization entanglements is through a design called the sonnet loop. Here, a polarizing beam splitter divides the 780 nanometer pump laser into two counterpropagating beams with the same polarizations. These beams travel in opposite directions around the loop passing through the Piplin waveguide and interacting with the nonlinear medium, potentially create photon pairs. The two paths are then recombined at the polarizing beam splitters, with one path having an extra 90 degree rotation in its polarizations. Ideally, the output is a coherent superposition of two counterpropagating pair generation process, resulting in the quantum state described as alpha HH plus beta VV. The alpha and beta coefficients are determined by the pump splitting ratio in a sonnet loop. We actively monitor the pump power circulated in both directions and send feedback signal to this liquid crystal wave plate to control the pump polarizations. This allows us to adjust the splitting ratio in real time, maintain the alpha beta values equal over many hours or even days, creating a maximally entangled state known as the polarization bell state. Due to the broad phase matching condition in this time zero pair generation process, the frequency correlated signal and other photons centered around 1560 nanometers have a bandwidth spanning roughly 18 terahertz, or 150 nanometers, covering the full optical C-band and L-band. These broadband photon pairs are then redirected to a wavelength demultiplexer, where the signal and other photons are separated into two optical fibers for manipulation and detections. Now that the signal and other photons are separated into two fibers, we can manipulate them individually before final detections. These photons are very broadband, so we use commercial device called pole shapers or wavelength selected switches WSS in short, to further demultiplex these photons into finer frequency channels. Think of these switches as a more advanced version of regular dense wavelength division multiplexers. They can be reconfigured through software, allowing us to change optical filter settings and direct different parts of the optical bandwidth to different fiber outputs. For example, these two devices here support optical C-band operations for our signal photons and L-band operations for our island photons. We can program the devices to dissect our full bandwidth into 300s of independent wavelength channels, assign different channels to a total of 20 fiber outputs. Our ultimate vision is to have these 20 fibers each connecting to a different user at different quantum nodes across the campus network. 
Each of these fibers leads the photon to these polarizing analyzers. This analyzer consists of wave plates on motorized rotation stages, followed by polarizing beam splitter cubes. We can send commands through the network to rotate this wave plate to specific angles, allowing them to perform the necessary projections for tasks like quantum state tomography, remote state preparations, and other quantum applications. We have several of these analyzers across many labs on the campus, all connected through deployed fibers to send photons across the campus for measurements. Finally, after the polarization projections, these photons were sent to highly efficient superconducting nanowire detectors for detections. These devices operate below minus 270 degrees Celsius, facilitating single photon detections with around 90% efficiency and very low dark count rate. Once the photon is detected, it generates a very short electrical pulse, which we send to a FPGA board, the programmable microprocessor for time tagging. Photons from the same entangled pairs can arrive at their respective detectors within a very short time, often just tens of picoseconds apart. Therefore, having the accurate timing reference or a synchronized clock shared between these FPJ boards in different labs is very crucial. To achieve this, we use a technology called the Y-Rabbit system, synchronized physically separated nodes through two-way time transfer between the Y-Rabbit master and individual switches connected by optical fibers. The switches then output clock signals to the FPJ board recording the experimental data, give us time synchronization precision at one trillionth of a second. With all these devices, we have performed many proof-of-concept demonstrations with our wavelength multiplex and tangle photon sources on our campus network. Now, I'll hand things over to Alex Noshevsky, who will introduce you to another research area with the goal of shrinking this setup into photonic chips the size of our fingertips. One goal we are pursuing in this lab is to take tabletop quantum networking experiments and see how we can integrate the devices onto an integrated photonic chip. Photonic integrated circuits are analogous to electrical chips with some stark differences. We use light as the information carrier instead of electricity, and signals are transmitted through waveguides instead of resistors and electrical wires. We are hoping to move generation, manipulation, and measurement of our quantum states from tabletop devices onto small, compact, and reliable chips to pave a path for scalable, reliable, chip-based quantum devices that will improve the cost and adaptability of quantum for applications. On the optical table, we have the chip probing station for coupling our fibers into the waveguide of the chip for testing. The chip probing station consists of a dual gooseneck LED lamp and microscope for imaging the chip. Two six degree of freedom stages, three translational and three rotational, for precision alignment between the fiber array and the chip for the purpose of obtaining maximal optical coupling. A vacuum pump to keep the chip secured to the stage and a thermoelectric cooler for maintaining the chip at a stable temperature. Looking at the chip under the microscope, you can see the polarization entangled photon source I will be showcasing today. Additionally, you can see a few supporting circuits that aid in running the circuit. The first circuit is the bottom circuit called the feedback loop. The feedback loop assists in coupling between the chip and the fiber array. The second circuit is a polarization splitter rotator, or PSR. The PSR is used to split the input light into two separate paths depending on the polarization of the light. We do this because we want to monitor the splitting ratio between our two polarizations and make sure that we maintain a splitting ratio that will produce an ideal polarization bell state. The final circuit is the polarization entangled source. Here we are using a combination of two polarization splitter rotators and a large microring racetrack in order to generate our polarization entangled bell state over a broadband spectrum. Next is the experimental procedure we use to generate the polarization of entangled photons on chip. First we start the, with the pump laser. Here we have a Santec tunable semiconductor laser that can operate from 18, 80 nanometers to 1620 nanometers, pumping light at around 1560 nanometers. The TSL570 will shine laser light at a wavelength that corresponds with one of the resonances of the microring resonator on our chip. Before we need to do some noise filtering. The laser light goes through a series of dense wavelength division multiplexers, or DWDMs. The DWDMs are similar to the WDMs, except here the light outside of the DWDMs bandwidth is being filtered out. Then we use a polarization controller to tune the splitting ratio of the two orthogonal polarizations that will couple into the chip. For our use case, we can imagine coupling horizontal polarization clockwise into the ring and vertical polarization counterclockwise. The output of the polarization controller connects to our V-Groove fiber array that couples into the chip. Using the fiber array mounted on the Maple Leaf chip probing station, the motorized controllers help us align the fiber array in six degrees of freedom, three translational degrees and three angular degrees, to the chip. Once the fiber array is aligned to the chip and the coupling fine-tuned, the filter pump light will couple into the microring resonator on the chip. Here we have one device that is very commonly used in integrated photonics, a microring resonator. The microring resonators are an optical waveguide which is looped back on itself with repetitive resonance structures evenly spaced and given by the free spectral range. 
The circuit has been designed to pump light in both directions of the ring and generate entangled photons and energy matched resonances determined by energy conservation. We match the pump light of our laser to one of the resonance structures. Then through a nonlinear optical process known as spontaneous four-way mixing, two pump photons are used to create two entangled photons. Once the entangled pairs are generated, we collect the pairs back out of the fiber array. Going through another set of DWDMs, we hope to filter out any excess pump light that might have coupled out of the ring. Now with the entangled pairs generated, we are ready to transmit the entangled pairs to the other table for measurement. There we will perform the quantum state tomography where we make a series of measurements of our quantum state and do some numerical computing post-processing to analyze and reconstruct it. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed our brief quantum networking tour at Oak Ridge National Laboratory.